Hi guys, this is Sunny Chase, and we're here in Hollywood at Sunset Gower Studios, the Sunny Chase Show, and it is a beautiful March day. It is spring. We're moving into a new energy. Thank the God above and below and all around us. And I'm very excited today because we're going to be talking about a lot of things. We're going to be talking about the kids movement. We're going to be talking about conscious coupling and uncoupling. We're going to be talking about peaceful conflict resolution in all kinds of ways. And and we're going to be talking about images, uh, how we can bring images and what they can mean. And I have the perfect person for you today. I'm so excited. He just flew in, touched down a short bit ago from Colorado. My dear friend, Carl Studna, and I'm going to keep talking about him, but Jarvis, can we just bring him on? <laughs> so Hi, Carl. Oh my God. I hope we, do we have applause? I thank you. Because <laughs> I can feel it everywhere. I just want to make sure you. it's thundering from the rooftops. So, Carl, I am so excited that you're here. Oh, it's so wonderful to be here with you. It's been a little bit in the planning because you're a busy, busy cat mm -hmm. jumping around. And um, I just want to tell people a little bit about you. Uh, I sort of brought you right on because I want people to see your beautiful face and mm -hmm. not just Thank look you. at me. But Carl has been uh, a person who has photographed people all over the world inside, outside of some of the most uh, delicate places. And uh, I was thinking about that when I introduce you, Carl, or when I talk about you, I talk about Carl is like ne uh, National Geographic, but much more sensitive and much more um, reverent. And so we're going to actually talk about Na National Geographic a little bit today, but I just want to bring you on and there's so many things to talk about. So hi. Hi, <laughs> Welcome to LA. Thank you. I always <laughs> love coming. I grew up here, as you know. Yes, yes. Yeah. And so I, the first thing I want to talk about, um, I just kind of want to get right to it, is, is your new book. I want to mm -hmm. talk about um, evolution of loving. Yes. I had to actually look at the title because I know it, but it's just so beautiful. Putting that together, the words evolution of loving is not, you just don't always hear that. So No, you don't. <laughs> so my tongue did not immediately go there. So, mm -hmm. um, But I will let your tongue go there. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. And the reason it's called evolution of loving is for a few reasons. One it was important to me to have in the title uh, that love is always evolving. Mm -hmm. It's never stagnant. Mm -hmm. And and loving rather than love, because I wanted to really stress that love is a verb. Yay. Love is always in movement. It's always expanding. Mm -hmm. And it never, um, never really maintains the same form. The, I think the essence and the energy is always uh, true and honest and present. Mm. But the form continually is shifting. Yes, and you chose um, many people, or eight couples in particular, to be part of the book, and I, I'm assuming you had others, but you know, mm -hmm. one edits <laughs> mm -hmm. in life and gets the, you know, what's cohesive and what makes sense. And to have uh, this concept of uh, really laying out uh, people's, um, shall I say, raw story, uh, extremely personal, extremely intimate, uh, story. Uh, before we talk about that, I want to tell you something that I heard uh, breaking news when I came in today. I was listening to um, uh, something about National Geographic. I was sort of chatting about that earlier. And they are doing a huge mea copa, you probably know about this, uh, acknowledging the fact that the magazine over the last 158 years, and certainly in the early part of the 1900s, was very racist, yeah. was very, very uh, otherness, I'll use that word, was showing um, people of color in an absolutely, I mean, we would say now, uh, just obnoxious, I almost want to say, I guess I just did, a uh, painful, painful, uh, belittling sort of way. Mm -hmm. And um, I love the fact that they're doing a mea copa and they're really digging in and they're telling the truth about that. Um, the fact that there was so much airtime or, or visual time spent on people in other parts of the world and, and having them just really seem like other, uh, it's embarrassing to say it, so I'm having a hard time speaking, uh, you know, less, less than, uh, less than human even. And meanwhile, really not paying attention to what was going on in the civil rights movement and different mm -hmm. things that were happening with people of color around the northern part of our world. And so... I just kind of want you to talk to that, being that you are a person of such sensitivity when you go into photographing people. Mm -hmm. Well, 
I mean, isn't that the good news? <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> a little bit. That's the good news. I mean, I think as far as National Geographic goes, um, as with the world in general, we're always evolving. And National Geographic, I believe, started with the whole concept because that's where we were living 158 years ago in this, you know, that imperialist sort of mentality, you know, yeah. that that the white, you know, uh, privileged were are the ones that were more... Um, everything. Everything. More sophisticated, more intelligent, all of that. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. fortunately, over time, uh, I think it's one of the beautiful things, and you were talking about this, that an intention can start in one way, you know, with them, where perhaps their intention initially was just to show these remote areas of the world that people normally would not see. And then through that, even though that even though there was the uh, bias and the prejudice, the bigotry, uh, through time and exposing the world more to other countries, other nations, other civilizations, that's where the wisdom can come from. So, mm -hmm. so the intention might have been different when it started, but then it grows into the inclusiveness. Right, and I think um, I appreciate you saying that. I also see that it, it lasted for a really long time as mm -hmm. far as National Geographic goes. I mean, it lasted, mm -hmm. it outlasted its relevance in showing people a certain way, sort mm -hmm. of like get with the times. And mm -hmm. so, um, and that really informed a lot of people's viewpoint because for God's sakes, it was in National Geographic. I mean, right. it, it, they didn't flat out say stuff, but just sort of the way they framed things. And so it was like, well, that's just common knowledge. Or that's just the way it is in African or Aboriginal na areas or nations or, or communities. Yeah. So I'm really, I feel like there's so much cracking open right now. It's sort of amazing. It just feels incredible to me uh, that that this at this moment that we live in today in March in 2018 with so much divisiveness going on that there's also an undercurrent of cleaning up our bleep, bleep, bleep. <laughs> yes. So I would love for you to, so thank you for your mm -hmm. words about that. And so let's chat about kind of your journey um, first with, you know, just how you have taken photos. I mean, I know, you know, you've taken photos of Michael Beckwith and Ricky Bars Beckwith and, you know, Paul McCartney. I mean, just so many people who um, and the way you've done it. So that's why I love how you do it. And they that's how they let you into their <laughs> chambers, <laughs> I'm sure. So how what kind of process is that for you? It starts with inspiration. Mm -hmm. It all it all stems from what inspires me, mm -hmm. uh, and and that's I think that's been the case since I started photography when I was fifteen, mm -hmm. uh, following the spark, mm -hmm. so to speak, mm -hmm. and and what really ignites mm -hmm. me, and uh, and people mm -hmm. that ignite and inspire me. Mm -hmm. Same was true with musicians in the in the nineties, uh, the late eighties through the probably the late 90s, I had such a strong focus on photographing different iconic musicians I grew up with because they inspired me. Their, mm. their music inspired me, their messages. So everything in me felt compelled and drawn to be able to meet them, spend time, photograph them, hang out, get to know them in a certain way. And mm. um, and it, I think it holds true with uh, most of the things that I do, mm -hmm. that I choose to do, mm -hmm. is following that that golden thread of inspiration. Mm. Ah, let us all do that. <laughs> let us all breathe that in, mm. <laughs> shall we, people? Uh, I think that's so important. I speak to sometimes young people about what they're doing or what they want to do or what they don't want to do. and um, Or I, I say to them always, because you know, of course they're concerned about making money and this sort of thing, and I say, you know, I actually, honestly, um, some people who are thinking of, of businesses where they want to like create a product or, or mm -hmm. a service or something. And I say, you know, really the truth is if you can find something that you really, really want, you know, you want to have it, if it's clothing, if it's a, if it's some sort of technology, if it's a product of any kind, and you kind of can't find it in the, you know, the land <laughs> around mm -hmm. you. It's like, that's what's a cool inspiration because you love it so much that you really want it for yourself and for everybody you know. And I think, as opposed to, well, you know, what could maybe bring me a buck or two? Mm -hmm. I think, don't you think that that's such a great way to kind of allow our, our rudder to be... Uh, Absolutely. <laughs> to be ruddered? <laughs> yeah, you know, and I, I believe, and this is how my life has shown this to be true for me, that whatever I follow what inspires me, uh, 
it's always linked to contribution as well. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. how mm. how I can contribute in a certain way. Mm -hmm. um, the book that you referenced, Evolution of Loving, mm -hmm. uh, is a perfect example of that, where I began it 25 years ago. Mm. And yeah. uh, and just to talk a little bit about it, Please. It, um, it started with the idea of photographing couples that are deeply in love, have an authentic, devotional, loving relationship that's growing, that where they're both mutually open to growing and expanding in their love and in their communication with each other. Mm. And it grew from there, starting with photographs, intimate, beautiful, sepia tone, intimate photographs, uh, to then doing basic interviews with them, asking them questions about how they uh, grow in their love, how do they anchor trust with each other, mm -hmm. uh, just mm -hmm. some basic questions. And then with some of the couples that grew to going back and doing further interviews over time, mm -hmm. and, and with some of the older couples, uh, some of the spouses had passed, so it, it, then it involved the passing of one of Ooh. the spouses. Um, with one of the couples, one of their children had passed. Uh, I photographed two births. Uh, so it really became a much broader uh, project than, than just the initial idea of seeing the love in each other's eyes. Right. Yeah. And, um, and yeah, and so you were inspired originally by a dear friend of yours. Let me see. Oh, I have lovely, lovely notes that I wrote for you also. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah, and so I think that's so uh, so important. And and again, in the book, I started reading it at first uh, to tell you. I I looked and I saw okay, these people are like, you know, older people naked. Like okay, Carl, what's up here? Um, <laughs> and then I um, I really read you know the stories, and I appreciated your opening up about where you were mm -hmm. in relation to something that they were going through. Mm -hmm. And it either was something that was happening with for you at that time or something that you just remember really being a struggle for you at some point in your life. And so you could really relate and you lay it out. So I feel like for you guys reading this book, it's not just a, I mean, the photos are a beautiful and that's part of the story, but the actual, um, you know, reading it from from the first page to the last page, I think it's a really great idea. Yeah, because it really, I, I did my best to get as much diversity as possible. Mm -hmm. So it has couples from all ages, different ethnicities, different sexual preferences. Uh, and I, I believe that most people will be able to find in, in some of these stories something that they can really relate to. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's commonalities, you know, that all the couples have. Yeah. With like, like how do they anchor more deeply in trust within mm -hmm. themselves and with each other? It's a huge one. <sighs> yeah. And I feel like we've been hearing over and over in the last, I don't even know how many years, let's just say 10 for sure. One cannot love others unless one loves themselves. And, you know, it becomes pat. It becomes sort of, you know, cliche almost. And, of course, you and I both know it's completely true. And yet, how does one do that and where does one do that? Does one do that before they get in a relationship? Do they sort of navigate, you know, kind of like having two feet on running horses at the same time to it, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I guess it just depends on what shows up and comes up and that sort of thing. But... I think that that's really um, it. What well, I got a lot of that from the people, you know, really seeing how they were much more able to see what was uh, not working for them mm -hmm. in relation as opposed to not. Oh God, yeah. You know, mm -hmm. I uh, before I started this project, as I said, it was. 25 years ago this year, which mm. just astonishes me. You're not that old. That's a long time yeah, in your right. life. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the funny thing is is that, that, my niece, <laughs> that my niece Jessica is almost as old as I was when I started this. Sheesh. So Because she was a kid. You know, Yay. Anyway, um, so where were we going with We that? were talking about um, just about knowing that we need to love ourselves first, but, you right. know, again, it being a cliche, but also realizing that within a relationship. Yeah. And, as and tough as that you. may be. <laughs> you follow me. I followed you back. Okay. Um, and I, at the time that I was beginning this, uh, I had been out of a relationship for about eight years, mm -hmm. um, a painful marriage ending. And um, 
was learning a lot during mm-hmm. that single time, mm-hmm. um, growing a lot, a lot of ups and downs. Um, and I do believe that working on this project, two years into the project, is when I w- met my my current wife, Cynthia. Mm-hmm. And the project really was like a glue. It was It was sort of like an imprint for being able to see what worked for people, what didn't, uh, the commonalities, the threads, the opening up, how willing was I to be to open more to trusting love, to being more vulnerable with a, in a relationship, mm-hmm. in, in the beginnings of a relationship. So I, I do believe that this project really was the catalyst for me, bringing mm-hmm. in somebody different than I'd ever been with, because mm-hmm. she's a very strong, um, creative uh, woman. And... Uh, and it was it was something different. Yeah. And because it was something different, and and she was also mutually willing to go deep, and continue, and we continue to, that the love continues to evolve. Well, what I think is so cool about your relationship, and I think it's a great model, is that. Um, Contrary to sort of the older, old-fashioned, shall I say, relationships, you guys are really, really your own people. You're very mm-hmm. strong. You're successful in your own lives. You have a lot of um, passions yourself. You know, I know I tell my kids that. It's like that's one of the things that when people talk about, well, love yourself first, and, and then you can love other people. I mean, I think that it's so important to really have your life. Yes. You know, and love your life and love your, love your mu- you know, have your identity or whatever you want to call it. Like just a lot of rich stuff that you do. Mm-hmm. You know, and you're pretty clear about stuff and you know how you want to take care of your body and you know that your morals are a certain place and your integrity is in a certain place and your and your worldview is in a certain place. That's my thing. I can't imagine being with somebody who's not having my worldview. That's just maybe I need to work on that. But at this point, that's what I choose. Um, and then having somebody a partner with had all that good juju going on too mm-hmm. and then coming together so it's not that you know you can bleed me thing you know or I need you it's like we're just coming together and we're just having this blast every day and re-choosing it every day and those things that, that you wise people talk about <laughs> well, one of the couples in the book Rick and Susan uh, they talk about I mean he talks as a man about and he was older at the time I mean he was probably in his well it's probably in his late sixties at that time, um, and he talked about as a man, what did it mean to really see his partners being equal? Mm-hmm. Now, you and I grew up, you know, in the, you know, really in the teenage mm-hmm. years, birthing from the civil rights movement and and the sexual revolution and all that. So, and we also had very modern parents. Yeah, I had progressive parents yes. too, and, and grew up in a liberal area. You know, mm-hmm. Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. So all of that played a factor. But uh, so I thought when I was a teenager that I really knew what that meant. What does it mean to be equal? You know, equal. OK, we're all equal. You know, in theory, yes. But the conditioning that everybody has to some in some form or another, mm-hmm. the male conditioning, the female conditioning, mm-hmm. how to catch that, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and and how to really be responsible mm-hmm. for our uh, choices and the words that we say, and all of Absolutely. that, all of that is like reevaluating in a deeper way what it what it truly means to be equal mm-hmm. for mm-hmm. men and women being mm-hmm. equal. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, I love when you're talking about words because I'm always playing with words, and I I really you know even on this show people know that there's certain words that just mean so much, and and certain words we just don't use. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I was at the Conscious Life Expo and doing a bunch of stuff there, and Carolyn Mays was there, and she was talking about words, and there were certain words that she just wanted to get rid of, like, you know, the obvious ones we know, like can't and won't and Mm -hmm. all of that, but also things like entitlement and privilege. And I thought, you rock on, you know, Carolyn, because it's so true. You know, we have this kind of entitlement, you know, vibe, and then she was moving into much more, you know, kind of positive Mm -hmm. words to, Mm -hmm. to, 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 replace that with and I think it's super important because I notice it even changes my um, my feeling like when I tell other people to, uh, like I have a sister I always advise her to say instead of saying I have to all these things I just say change that one word to I get to yeah it really shifts things when you do that yeah it's like okay yeah. I get to do the dishes because I have dishes I have a family I have food to cook I have a roof over my head like there's a lot that changes that word as opposed to I have to right so absolutely 
<clears throat> and that's just a really simple example of you know what you're talking about and in communication being responsible mm-hmm. for mm-hmm. for what we say because we do until we get to another place where everything is mental telepathy for sure like the bushman by the way speaking of <laughs> of who is not lower than anything is who is probably more developed than any of us on the planet uh <clears throat> excuse me um we do use our words often. Of course, it's tone and it's expression mm-hmm. and, and things like that. But, you know, a lot of times it is words that, that can bring us in or can really repel us. Absolutely. And intimate relationships or, or relationships that, um, are, that you're with the person all the time, uh, they're the greatest mirrors. Mm-hmm. You know, they're the mm-hmm. best mirrors for being able to see when we're being conscious, when we're being awake, mm-hmm. when we're being inclusive, mm-hmm. or when we're not, mm-hmm. or when we're coming from fear. Yeah, fear, or lack, or, yeah, or, but, well, which is fear. I mean, you know, like mm-hmm. we know now, it's just everything is about fear. Like when I look at people who are really, really, you know, angry or really holding on to a point of view really tightly, I think, what are you afraid of? Like, mm-hmm. let that, let's have some room in there. You know, I so appreciated um, to bring in one of our friends, Michael Beckwith. I was at Agape on Sunday, and um, he has a kind of a prayer affirmation for the people every Sunday. And he, um, I was going to bring it in and actually read it because it was it's so rocked. But it was basically, um, you know, during these times of, of just complete divisiveness with our political situation, mm-hmm. which unfortunately spills into everything it feels like right now, um, to find the love for all people and and that's the hardest place sometimes but where we may not agree or we may not feel heard or we may not um yeah uh, you know groove with their ideology it's like well but we still are in a place like let us be the ones who still love it may not be everybody but if we in this room can do that what a difference that would make so amen to you brother and look at that beautiful picture that now Jarvis has brought up because that picture oh, was actually yeah. taken by Carl. Mm-hmm. So did you know that, Jarvis, when you pulled that up? Well, Jarvis is the best. He's our producer, as you guys know. So <laughs> thank you, Jarvis, for that. Um, and yeah, I that love picture, that picture of Michael, Yeah, actually. that picture, I'll talk about it for a moment. Please. Uh, there, are, there are moments, there are times when I have these inner visions. Mm. And they usually come in meditation or in a still time. Uh, and... In the case of portraits, uh, when I get an inner vision with somebody specific, it's very important that I follow it through. Mm. Because first off, they all they always, not not always, they usually manifest. They usually take form. It could be a while. Mm-hmm. You know, time is you know, time is time is a man-made thing. You know, right. there's there's our time <laughs> and there's spirits' time. You know, yeah. uh, so. But I had this vision, very specific vision of that that picture with mm-hmm. Michael, and uh, and it just, whenever that happens, where uh, everything orchestrates to come together, um, I just watch. I watch. It's like it's already done, kind the, of with Im- wonder. I yeah, bet the yeah. image is already complete, and and then and then I'm just the vehicle that shows up, and. Does the orchestration gets the lighting right, gets the pose and the way I see it and all that, and then it's it's like magic. It's oh, like it's goodness. like being in, in the in the dark room that when there were dark rooms yeah. and watching something appear because it's, it's sort of like that, where where it's it's divine vision inspired vision in spirit, mm. mm-hmm. and then it just comes through and then honoring that. So again, it comes back to that message of how how important it's been for me to honor those inner visions when I get them, especially when they're very specific. Mm. So it happened with Michael, happened with Deepak Chopra, with this picture of his where he's holding a candle that I, that I shot. And, and it was a complex shot. And he was patient because it took time. It was several seconds per shot that I was doing to get it to look exactly as it did. But it met that vision. Mm. And, you know, I just see that that's one of the huge reasons why I'm here is to listen, to be as dutiful as I can mm. to the inner messages, and as an artist, uh, follow through with those. Just keep mm. saying yes to them. 
Yes, that's it. Saying yes to it. Oh my gosh, I know th- about that. And I feel like on this show or even now I'm I'm doing some writing for Whole Life Times and for doing that, I feel like what happens is I get this feeling of um, a subject that I, I just feel so strongly that some people may want to know about more deeply. You know, they may not really understand something about the environment or about food or about whatever it is that I feel so strongly about. And then it's like, okay, well, who is that person? Because it's not me. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, you guys, some of you know who I am, but a lot of, you know, you know other famous people much more than me. So I like to get a voice that, you know, all you guys know, (laughs) and then let them bring it, you Mm -hmm. know, and it's so important and it's so exciting, you know, to do that. And I, I just don't, I, I, the same thing happens. I feel who it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times it's kind of interesting. Like it's not the normal suspect, you know, it's not the usual suspect, it's, which makes it more fun. Yeah. And you you could call it intuition, you Mm -hmm. know, call whatever you want. Well, it's it's definitely imagination and creativity. It's following, it's following the intuition. When I was a clothes designer, when I was a young, I started really young and and going, you know, for quite a long time. And I love to take the craziest uh, fabrics. Now it's very, very common, but years and years ago, when I was a little kid, I would take um, like camo, you know, and put it in bikinis and Mm-hmm. All these, and I was 13, and that uh-huh. was a long time ago. Or <laughs> doing denim. Um, my stepmom would make these things for me that were just not anywhere around, and she would just break n- the Singer sewing machine needles. But it was like, I want a denim skirt. Well, guys, you know, that was not heard of. When I went to school, we, we couldn't even wear um, pants to school, so it wasn't about jeans. And, you know, so, but I just would get, I would love to put together weird things that mm-hmm. went with other things. So now I get to do it with people and concepts. That's right. You yeah. know, it's so one other thing that I wanted to say about when you were talking about words is, again, oh, the communication. Um, right now we're moving at some point into the environmental you know, day, Earth Day, which I always say, why can't every day be Earth Day? Because it actually is. <laughs> um, and Al Gore has decided, you know, his movie, uh, The Inconvenient Sequel, came out, you know, a few months ago. And he's been working on this project um, where he t- brings people. People can go. Like, you guys can go. Check it out on the website. It's like, it's algore.com or whatever. Find it. It's pretty easy to find. Um, I think it's called uh, climatereality.com, actually, mm-hmm. or .org. And he brings people together for three days to find a way, or he lets people know how to have the conversation about climate change or what use you know because we used to say global warming and then that moved to climate change and because that was a little more accurate or um so to to have the conversation with people so we don't put people off we don't immediately have them go into defensiveness right. like we're attacking so that there's air and breath in the conversation yes. and there's there's a possibility to get our message across without having a closed door yes so that's what you found in your book i think Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's yeah. Evolution of loving is it feels very pure, mm-hmm. you know, and and it's possible, people. We can be pure in our communication. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we can't actually do that. Yeah, it's, it's not. It doesn't have to be it, like it used to be. I think it's uh, a matter of listening. Mm-hmm. And I'll just apply it to this project because mm-hmm. this was such a sensitive project. Cool. I mean, it's. I mean, the, as you were referencing. Um, all the couples are in some form of intimacy, and some are very intimate. And it was as if going into the holiest of temples, sanctuaries with them mm-hmm. and honoring them in such a deep level of, mm-hmm. of just really blessing mm-hmm. their relationship, their love, who they are, and staying in that space mm-hmm. while I was photographing them. Mm-hmm. So... So when I say pure, I mean the photographs are pure. They're not, they're not at all um, arranged or directed. Uh, it's, it's each couple being very authentic with each other. In, in, so you see in the images so many different feelings ranging from vulnerability to uh, devotion to passion all of these different joy qualities. laughter and joy laughter frivolity <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a lot of that i, I will say yeah. there's a lot of frivolity yes, going a on frivolity. a lot of fun going on yeah. <clears throat> well one thing that i'd like to say as a compliment to you and you know, just sort of in the world that we're we're in right now as far as 
understanding um I mean, I think of it having white privilege uh, and then working on the cannabis situation or with uh, formerly incarcerated women um, that were at a time, it, it feels ancient. I mean, it feels ancient and yet it's also a really possible now, <laughs> a now now, um, with honoring, and honoring even feels kind of judgmental. It's like just knowing, I guess I want to say, that we all you know, have a place in the sun. We are all equal. And this idea of um, humans in the Western world, especially, being so arrogant, it just mm. kind of shocks me constantly. You know, working in the environmental world for so many years and listening to the way people do that. And again, it goes to the words, it goes to, you know, how we, how we uh, phrase things. But it's like, oh, no, 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 people like, <clears throat> There's a friend of mine who wrote a book now called A Love Earth Now, uh, Cheryl, and she has a story in the book about this pigeon that she uh, meets, uh, I mean a real pigeon. She's shopping at a store and the pigeon is sitting in one of those like little areas where the cars mm -hmm. don't go. And then she comes back from the shopping and the pigeon's still there. So she sits down and chats with the pigeon. She's a, a major environmentalist like me, you know, cries over when people people leave a straw on the street it just it's too hard for me sometimes uh, but anyway so she's chatting with the pigeon she took the pigeon to the hospital pigeon hospital and unfortunately the pigeon did pass away because it was just you know but then in her book she goes into a whole explanation of the history of the pigeon of the homing pigeon of how many mm -hmm. lives were saved in world war ii of how this homing pigeon um, mm -hmm. gift the to value. human. The right. value yeah. has gone back centuries. Mm -hmm. um, and then also sort of the wingspan and the muscular and all that. And I thought, rock on, Cheryl, because, mm -hmm. you know, we sit and say, oh, rats in the sky or whatever. We're so, we, we, many of us, um, just so belittle things that are smaller than us yeah. or whatever. And, you know, we think of grand elephants as being grand, but we don't look at a bee and say, that's grand mm -hmm. or an ant that is grand. It's just smaller. Yeah, or sometimes until it's an emergency, like well, with the bees even right still, now. even yeah. still, yeah. Um, one of our, I mean, I'm just going to say I was on the phone with um, your dear friend Kenny Loggins, and I was chatting with him about a number of things, and we were talking about the fact that there's a, uh, there's a problem in Santa Barbara about water, and people are not really willing to face it, or mm -hmm. do anything about it, or get on board, or whatever it is and it's like and I asked him and we had a long conversation about what do you think it's going to take and of course there are many who are awake um, he calls it a spiritual crisis that we're in that, mm -hmm. that it's it, that that's where we are and that it's really not a that's what it is so I feel like kind of telling the truth about that and realizing that that is what it is that we do have this still um, prejudice and this still disconnect this still listening to Dr. Bruce and Lipton and knowing yes we're all one and yet you know am I really the same as you am I really the same as that tree you know mm -hmm. am I really the same well, as that rat that's running yeah, around or it's, whatever it's such an interesting topic yes. because <laughs> but it's be, hard for me yeah to because it all the it's time. A, I think there what I continue to learn the older I get is that that life is just full of paradox. You know, there's, okay. there's just there we go. There's just paradox in everything, <laughs> and there we go. So yes, we're all one, <laughs> mm -hmm. and we're all diverse. Yeah. You know, and I th I see mm -hmm. that what is calling us right now as a people in our in our country and in the world is a greater recognition that not only that we're all one, mm -hmm. but embracing the wisdom and the diversity of each culture, of each person, because it's in the diversity that comes greater knowledge, mm -hmm. comes greater wisdom. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like that's why we don't, we don't uh, mate with our first cousins or, you know, or, 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 or you know, close siblings, because mm -hmm. there needs to be the diversity. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, and... Uh, it seems that we're continuing to require greater chaos in order to continue to wake up more. Well, yeah, and I, I, I think that's true. And I also like, and I hope it happens more and more, the, uh, the, the desire for true knowledge. You know, um, we talk a lot now in the last year about fake news and false news and well, fake news is what it is. I and I realize um, doing what I do that I love to really read and read and read and get deeper, deeper, deeper. Um, 
I just love that. And so, and I've studied a lot of the, about the Constitution. I've had different constitutional, you know, major cats on this show. And so I have to do my, you know, homework to prepare for them. And for example, with the, um, I mean, just today, uh, this show is going to be played when you guys hear it. It's going to be a week later, but we're actually recording this on a day where kids, it's going to make me cry, kids all over this country are leaving the class, standing together in silence for 17 minutes, and they're doing it all over the country. Mm -hmm. And it's rolling out because it's, you know, 10 o'clock, wherever it's 10 o'clock. And I was listening to some of the kids and they were like, we're here, we're loud, and we're angry, Mm -hmm. you know, and we're registering people to vote. And I just love to say to people, guys, you know, if you're going to talk about gun control, understand what has happened in this country, meaning what is the Second Amendment? What is the history of guns, guys? You can read a book called Gunfight by Adam Winkler that is so fascinating. It's so it reads like a John Grissom novel, Hmm. but it has all the information of guns at the NRA, where it started, what was going on with the Black Panthers, what was going on with uh, regulation what was going on in the Wild West. I mean, you did not go into the Wild West and shoot them up and, you know, shoot the whiskey things off. That No, no, no. You took your gun and you gave it to the sheriff in town. And then, you know, but Hollywood has made it way different. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the idea that we, again, back to the fear, uh uh-oh, you know, Obama's going to take away our Second Amendment right. We're going to go buy 12 more guns. It's like, ah, calm down, people. Well, there's the reaction that's happening, you know. And know know your stuff, peeps. Like, know your stuff. Mm -hmm. That's what I want to say. Yeah. Yeah. All I ever want. Know like, <laughs> your stuff. And for me too. <laughs> you know, just but, like, right? like just like think? with the civil rights movement, you know, yes. where where it reached a boiling point. Mm-hmm. You know, and it had to change. And enough people stood up mm-hmm. and changes started to happen. But let me even ask you something about that. Mm-hmm. I have a question about that. It reached a boiling point. Now, I think it's very interesting that you say that. I mean, like this isn't necessarily a whole show about civil rights. However, why not? Let's go. <laughs> Why wasn't the boiling point, you know, 20 years before? Why wasn't the boiling point 50 years before? You know what I mean? Like, there was a lot of goddamn bleep, bleep, bleep going on that was just, uh, I, you know, I can't even talk about. I'll be sobbing my eyes out for years and years and years and years. And, I mean, I know there's something that must happen in the, the, the human zeitgeist or something that goes on. And it does boil, I guess. But it's just like, whoa, like, what does it take? And that's what we're in right that's now. Right. Enough is enough. You know, the Me Too movement, the environmental movement, the kids standing up. It's like, what does it take? Why wasn't, I mean, I sorry to say why, because I usually don't do that. But, I mean, after Sandy Hook, like, why? why it's <laughs> that's astonishing. That's five years ago. It's just astonishing you know, that it here continues we are. to happen. Yeah, and that and that there aren't changes uh, that are that are taking place. Yeah, yeah and the, and the you know, the, the, the situation with our, uh, arresting and, and incarcerating our brothers and sisters. Like, when is that going to be a boiling point where people say, um, I don't think we're putting people in, not only in a cage that's not even, I mean, in Germany, they have like little apartments that are just, you know, really nice and they still feel incarcerated, but they have their dignity. Mm-hmm. You know, why don't we have that for the, a 70, 80,000, depending on where we are, you know, that we spend in for the, I mean, there's, we could do it a lot better. And then things like solitary confinement. We wouldn't do that with a chicken. We get very upset about eating an egg from a chicken that can be in a cage. But for some reason, we, you know, so I'm, I, I'm sorry, just when you said that we've gotten to the boiling point, I'm like, what, <laughs> what does it take, people? <laughs> what, does it, what does it take to not only wake up, but to take to have the collective action happen. And that's and what it is, because I is. think a number of people, like with the environment, you yeah. know, yeah. like Kenny was saying, I mean, it's like, and, and that's what I was asking, and that's what I continue to ask with the environmental thing. Like, guys, what is it going to take for us to stop using straws? You know, what is it going to take for us to stop using single-use products? Mm-hmm. Why do we think it's okay? You know, why are we so arrogant to say, oh, well, it's convenient, like when Al Gore, we were talking about earlier. Which is a brilliant title for his first, the first film of the Inconvenient And the Truth. Inconvenient sequel. Right. It's like, and I hear mm-hmm. that all the time as a mom when my kids were young. It's like, well, it's just more convenient. I'm like, I hate that word convenient. Yeah, I'll give you an example. Please. Um, with climate change, mm-hmm. uh, we live in the Colorado Rockies in the mountains. Mm-hmm. And when we moved there, the first few years we had big dumps of snow during the winter time where I had to get out with the plow and and do some major work in the driveway and and, 
And I've watched progressively over, especially the last five, last 10 years, less and less that I'm needing to get out there and, and plow, less snowfall, where it's becoming the norm now in the wintertime when we have a snowfall to not get more than four to five inches mm -hmm. where it used to be a foot or mm -hmm. foot and a half. And you know why that is. I'll tell you if you don't. It's just really simple to explain to you guys. It, this is a simple way to explain it. There is a, like imagine a freezer, like in your kitchen, mm -hmm. in the North Pole, mm -hmm. and all the freezing is supposed to stay there. But it's like, okay, we've now opened the right. door, and all of that cold is coming into our living room. So now that's what's happening. So that's why these Nor'eastern situations are happening. Oh, my God, seeing the news and seeing all this. But it's like, guys, or, you know, on the other side, Santa Barbara not having enough mm -hmm moisture in its earth to be able to handle these fires mm -hmm. and then you know so um but the reason i brought it up yes was we're talking about inconvenience or mm -hmm. convenience and uh and it's caused me to look at like every winter now where it's getting less and less snowfall less to do and it's more convenient yeah you know <clears throat> it's more convenient that i don't have to get out there with a plow right uh it's more convenient in a lot of ways but that's just because it's more convenient, it doesn't feel good. Right. And just because it's now becoming the norm, it doesn't mean it's natural. Yeah. And um, Jarvis is telling us we're, we're going to be wrapping up in a short bit. So I, a couple of things I want to absolutely say to you, which is um, thank you so much for joining the Whole Life Times, which is mm -hmm. going to be coming out in, um, I guess it will be uh, April, will be the next issue. And you're doing, a, and this is the reason that I invited you to do it, because I feel like your sensitivity, which I was going to say even more about, so I will know. Um, um, being able to be a person who, if it is, you just have so much reverence for whatever it is you're taking a picture of. Mm -hmm. So when I took you to the editor-in-chief, Gina Servati, and said, can we have Carl like do a whole art gallery of the whole magazine? And I said, because I so trust Carl's um, voice in his image, you know, his heart in the image, that whatever he gives us is going to be sacred. It's not going to be taking advantage of any nature of any kind. And so I feel comfortable and safe to offer, uh, makes me cry, Carl, to you, so we can offer this to you guys. And so that's what I feel so important about. So anyway, thank you. <laughs> oh, you're so welcome. It's just, I mean, it's, it's a big deal. Oh, thank you. I just, I loved gathering pictures together for that issue. And, oh, my God. And, uh, and it was a great process for me because it was, as I'm looking at each image and choosing them to put in this folder, um, I was going more deeply into the reverence of how beautiful mm. that, mm. that I mean, and, and appreciative that I am for the, be the natural beauty that still does exist mm -hmm. in this world and how important it is for us to, to oh do what we gosh. can to maintain it. Yes, and um, I don't know if Jar Jarvis probably wouldn't be able to find, uh, but we'll see it next time. the The vision uh, that you that's going to be the cover. It's mm. so uh, edgy and cool, you know. So I love it because it's people within a tree, and I want to make sure that we get to everything. Um, is so we have just a couple more minutes. I want to make sure that we that we really um, talk about everything. So is there anything else that you want to? I want to make sure that you speak about. There's so many things I wrote down that are quotes from the book and stuff like that. So, guys, I definitely want you to go and check it out. And um, I understand it is uh, it, there is cause for celebration. Let us clink our glasses as yes. you tell us about the about how the book is doing. We're actually in the studio together, even though it may not look like it. I don't know. Yeah, I know. It kind of looks like two separate screens, but, <laughs> but we, we are really we are. are really looking at each other. Yeah. yeah. So tell us, tell us the good news. Well, the launch date for Evolution of Loving was last Tuesday, and um, on that date, due to many dear friends and colleagues that uh, came forward and really helped to support it, it hit uh, number one in all three Amazon categories. Woohoo! So, and that's really a great thing, not just because it's nice to be number one, but it's great because it helps to be able to get greater distribution for the project, yes. to get it out internationally. Yes. Because my greatest vision with this book is that it really reach millions of people across the world and mm. open hearts 
and help to heal any areas where our hearts are closed mm. so that we can open more fully to really understanding and deepening in what trust is. And the examples. In other words, I think that's what we love to see these days. And it may just be a beacon of light somewhere or a candle or mm. <clears throat> in the wind. But, you know, we see so much negativity and that becomes the normal. But it isn't natural and it isn't what we can yeah. aspire to. And even if there's just a few examples like Michael was talking about or you're talking about or any of the other or the kids that are that are standing in the street and saying, we're just not going to take it anymore. We're right. mad as hell and we're not taking it. Yeah. So um, if people go to uh, the URL evolutionofloving.com. Uh, then they you can, can see you everything. Can, you can see everything that you want to see about it and then order it on Amazon. Yeah, too. and I do love your book so much, Click, also. Mm, um, I don't know. is that That's on your website, too. That's on the website as well. Yeah. So um, we are wrapping up, and there's so many beautiful things that we're going to be talking about in the future here at the Sunny Che Show, as you guys always know that I want to do. But I just really appreciate you, Carl, um, mm. so much for being who you are in Thank our world you, um, and all of the things that you do. And is there anything else that we can say, Jarvis? Do we have like 30 seconds? So, guys, follow us on all the things, Twitter and all that stuff. And until next time, listen to our children, listen to the teens, let them be our leaders. Let us be quiet and listen to our teens. Until next time, this is Sunny. Bye. <laughs>